I'm the Executive Vice President Emerita of the National AFL-CIO. It is a fancy title. I don't do airplanes anymore much. I don't do hotel rooms and I eat home-cooked meals now that I'm retired and living back in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, the procedure for this afternoon is we expect Congressman Fatah any moment now. He just has a few minutes to spend with us. We're going to be glad to hear whatever comments that he has, uh, and we're going to give him whatever time that he, uh, that he needs, and then we will probably at that point in time bring forth our two panelists uh, this, this afternoon uh, to, uh, to have our, our uh, panel discussion. Uh, my role today is to, uh, to play uh, catch up, uh, try to uh, do a panel, and I've talked to both of the panelists who have agreed to do opening statements and closing statements, but we feel very strongly that this is also a way for us to hear from you, try to uh, allow for as many questions and as many comments as we possibly can. Uh, I am uh, going to try to wait until the congressman is here, uh, but let me first of all say as, as the uh, moderator here that I've got a deal for you. Uh, let me tell you what the deal is. If you had the opportunity to join an organization that would go in and fight for your rights as a worker, you would, wouldn't you? Someone that would go in and negotiate uh, better wages for you, negotiate a better insurance plan for your health insurance, uh, probably get you a few more days in vacation, uh, a few more holidays, uh, represent you if uh, you got problems on the job, and, and that would be what you would call a union. In addition to that union, you would also have an organization that represented your rights, not just as workers, but civil rights, human rights, uh, women's rights, uh, African-American rights, Hispanic rights, etc. Well, I represent that kind of an organization and have for 40 years. So we're going to talk a little bit about asset building. We're going to talk about uh, how African-Americans, Latinos, uh, Asian-Americans, and all kinds of people of color don't get to build the kind of assets that they need simply because they happen to be people of color. Uh, I believe they did I get a high sign that he's here? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, unions uh, have worked very hard over many, 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 many years, not just in representing the interest of their members, but in representing the interest of all workers. When you're talking about the creation of the 40-hour work week, uh, it wasn't just for unions, but it was for all workers. The creation of overtime after 40 hours was a fight that was, would benefit all workers. Uh, the issue of workers' compensation, the issue of unemployment insurance, all of these issues that unions have fought for over the years are not just benefits to union members, but benefits to all workers as we, as we know. Uh, some of those benefits have suffered uh, tremendously, especially in the last eight years, uh, because those, some of those rights and some of those benefits have been uh, slowly taken away from workers, slowly denied uh, to workers, and that has been especially important to the labor unions that we now have in office, a president who believes in those rights, a person who believes and who has made it known that he supports the Employee Free Choice Act, which gives people the right, without harassment, intimidation, threats, and coercion, to join a union. We have had many successful strategies in building unions in this country and in helping to build that middle class that was also very good at uh, building assets and sending their kids to college and providing for uh, a better tomorrow for the kids that they had and, the, and then the, the grandkids that they had. And now that isn't there in America today. We don't have a generation of parents that can promise their children a better tomorrow like their parents promised them. We've had a change in the workplace that in the last 15 years, uh, we've lost the jobs that gave you health insurance with that job or gave you a pension plan. Now those jobs allow you to save your money in a 401k or maybe it's down to a 101k at this point in time. So we, we, uh, we've had a lowering of expectations
for the middle class and a disappearing uh, middle class. Time and time again, uh, unions have developed many strategies on how to build uh, those assets for workers. And I will tell you one little short story before hopefully the congressman gets here. Uh, there was a group of women who were working at a mini blind uh, company in Boston. The majority of them uh, Brazilian, uh, Portuguese speaking women, who were treated very badly, uh, yelling, screaming, long hours, very low pay, and no respect whatsoever. Uh, they did not know what to do. Someone recommended them to the priest. The priest then said, I think I know a union that might help you. The union came. The union said, what do you want to do? He says, well, we need help. So they joined the union. They were threatened. They were harassed. They did one-on-one -on -one meetings. They did captive meetings. They said, uh, we will close the company. You will not have a job. And they were scared, but they said, well, you know, we're treated badly. How worse can it get? Uh, from that point forward, it was like a community project for that community area where they were and where the company was. And on one evening, the Interfaith Workers' Justice, the unions, the community, the religious and educational community came together, and they had a candlelight vigil outside the company gates. And it was very moving. They sang, they chanted, they rallied. They talked about all the wonderful things that these women could be provided. A few months after this, I had the good fortune to go to a meeting there. And this young lady got up with an interpreter and spoke to the, to the crowd and said, the union helped me. And she produced a check stub and said, this is my first union check with insurance for myself and my family with protection and a pension plan. I have a grievance procedure if I have problems on the job. And she said, and I earned more in one week than I used to earn in one month. That is building assets. This is what the unions do for workers. And these are stories, uh, many stories all over the country of that, but many, many more, many, many more that uh, where people are fired, uh, people are told that their jobs will be eliminated if they even make any attempts to join a union. And for many, many people, they, they don't understand that unions aren't just about working for workers and getting them into the union and taking their union dues as uh, the Chamber of Commerce and others want us to believe that that's all we want is just their union dues. Had it not been for the labor movement, uh, how could Dr. Martin Luther King been able to raise the monies that rented the buses that got people to rallies? And uh, he had union leaders marching with him and union uh, leaders who funded the labor, um, labor's part in the civil rights movement. Uh, many, many times uh, there should, should be like a little um, a column over, over to the left about where, where did the money come from? How, how did the civil rights movement support itself? Yes, it was the passion and the emotion of the people, but there was also the labor movement that was there. So I represent an organization that believes in building assets, but it also believes in civil rights, women's rights, equal pay, all of the things that all of us fight for, and it isn't an easy fight because even within the labor movement, there needed to be changes. I was the first woman of color elected to an executive office of the national AFL-CIO in 1995. <laughs> and it was a deliberate attempt by John Sweeney and Richard Trumka to change the face of the labor movement. Uh, the, my replacement is an African-American woman. So our place in the American labor movement is slowly, if not yet, taken complete uh, control. Not yet. Uh, we're going to get there. <laughs> but the point here is that the American labor movement is not just about what can we get for the members that we represent, but more importantly, what can we do to help everybody move up? And how we do it is by asking our allies 
by asking our friends, by asking those who believe in the same things that we all believe in to get people of color uh, to that point where they can uh, support themselves, send, send their kids to college, uh, provide and, and, and have a life and a standard of living. And the American labor movement is about that. Uh, my two panelists today are uh, Dr. Bill Spriggs, who is the chair of the Department of Economics at Howard University, and certainly a, a, a gentleman who uh, really needs no introduction because of all of the work that he's done and the advocacy that he has uh, presented many, many, many times. And also Kristen Moy, Director of Economic Opportunities Program uh, at the Aspen Institute. Uh, it, it's been now four years or five years we've been doing this, and until you decided that the conversation had to be changed and the people who engaged in it had to be changed. We just didn't have this group. So finally, you know, we're meeting here in the members room of the Library of Congress. Uh, so we've come a long way since those first meetings at, at Tuskegee. And, um, and, and it's just so important and so refreshing to finally have a room uh, where people are talking about these issues, but they're actually the people who are affected uh, by these issues, which uh, in Washington just doesn't take place. So it, it really is remarkable. Um, I want to say that, you know, most of you do asset building from the individual side, and you may wonder why do we have a panel on social insurance. But I think it is very important for us to remember that when you look at why people save, a big portion of that is to smooth their consumption. Part of that is the emergency factor that uh, you just heard Jeff Liebman refer to, that if you know you, you, you have something really bad happen, an accident to a child, uh, a health incident, that you don't have a bunch of calamities that then pull you out of where you would have been. But ultimately, you're trying to smooth your consumption because a day will come when you aren't working. And, and at that point, if you haven't saved, then you're proverbially up the creek without a paddle. So when you look at it from that perspective, then the biggest asset that most people hold is their social security account. And we present it to people as if it's not part of your savings, but it actually is the foundation for median income Americans. It is their foundation. They will go into retirement with 30 to 40 percent of their net worth being their social security. So it is an important component when we think about asset building. And it is an important way for us to think about how we might approach asset building. It does not necessarily mean that you must save, but it does mean that you must have resources to call on. And whether those resources come in the form of personal savings or whether they come in the form of an insurance really doesn't matter as long as you have the right to claim that asset. Now, uh, I've been quite shocked that um, the administration continues to focus on this financial calamity uh, and not lift the fifth uh, or sixth problem. Jeff listed five. There's a sixth problem, which is that for the American household, uh, over the last year, um, the wealth of, of the household sector has dropped by, net worth has dropped by close to $6 trillion, a little over $6 trillion. That's very close to the payroll of the United States. Now, a lot of people think that we will save our way out of it, but understand that what you're saying is you think that the American people who have lost in savings the entire year of payroll would save to make up for that loss. Th this is not going to happen in a small amount of time. It's not going to happen in a reasonable amount of time. So just as we must be concerned that the banks are made whole so that they can loan money, we have to think about do we want people to borrow money <laughs> when we know that there are already $6 trillion in the hole. Um, in particular, the reason why Americans are having a hard time getting out of the problem that they're in is that the, the run-up in debt looks like a rocket. It's not like this. It's like this. Uh, it's all tied to home ownership. These are loans that people took uh, equity out of their homes in order to make it through the eight years when incomes were flat. So we saw the ownership society, and we saw what it meant writ large, and writ large even for uh, median 
household folks, not poor folks, um, we saw that this is actually a disastrous way to look at society. That yes, you need this nest egg, but if we all need it, if we run into a systemic failure, then this ownership society idea, this idea that we would build up assets to make our way through it, it's a bad policy idea if there's a systemic failure. So this skyrocketing level of debt because it's tied to homes means the only way that people can get out of the debt is they gotta get out of the home. Now unfortunately in our communities, they're getting out of their home. The reason why it's a bad way is because when you get rid of that debt, you've also gotten rid of the asset because you don't own the home. So when we look at this drop, this $6 trillion drop in net worth, a large part of that is going to fall on people of color because we know disproportionately it hit uh, Latino families and, his, and, 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 and African American families. There is a way for the government, in fact, to meet the household sector halfway. And that is if we increase Social Security benefits. Because in essence, that is an annuity built out of an amount of savings. So even if you increase the benefit by a small amount, even if you increase it by only 5% or 10%, compared to when you go into retirement and that's 40%, you increase it by 10%, now you're up to 44%. It's a significant increase in the net worth of the household sector. It's not a small increase. When we were fighting privatization, most of us said, look, if people had all their money in these private accounts, if the market failed, as it did, the government would step in. Well, the market failed. People have now been wiped out in their retirement savings, and the response has been, what's wrong with this picture? Why, if it had been privatized, do people think it would have been a response? It wasn't privatized, but nonetheless, the third leg of the retirement stool, Social Security, your retirement savings, your home, well, your home just lost its value, your savings just lost its value, but we've got no response, no response for the household sector and how we would make that up. But there is a way to do that. Where would the money come from? Well, the federal government has just acquired all these assets. They're sitting in the treasury because of all these bailouts. We now own Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and a couple of other entities, AIG, which we probably don't want to own. But we own trillions of dollars worth of assets. But they sit in the treasury. They don't sit in the household balance sheet. They don't sit in the Social Security Trust Fund. If they sat in the Social Security Trust Fund, then we would know that they were in our piggy bank. Now the odd thing about what they're doing is, think about the national balance sheet. It's a flow of funds problem. The banks are complaining because they have assets that aren't worth anything. But that's one side of the balance sheet. You can't have assets that aren't worth anything unless on the other side of the balance sheet there's some liabilities. So if you only put money on one side of the equation, you can't, that's not an equation. Right? You can't add five to this side of the equation and you don't put five on this side of the equation. So what we've done so far is we've put five on this side of the equation, meaning that we've replaced the banks as being in the game. We've given them a holiday. They got a parachute. The rest of us are now still on the Titanic. They're on some lifeboat. They're waving at us. <laughs> Bye, see ya, wouldn't wanna be ya. So unless you put money on the household side, you haven't balanced that out. So instead of having the money sitting over in Treasury, which is not balancing it out, it really needs to be sitting in the household sector. The fair way, a fair way, a fair way, because it's everybody's piggy bank, is to put it into everybody's piggy bank. That's a fair way to do it. Second concern that we should have right now is we saw Governor Jindal respond to President Obama saying, I do not want the people of Louisiana to get unemployment checks. The people of Louisiana are too well off. <laughs> We're one of the wealthiest states. And the idea that part-time workers in our wealthy state will get an unemployment check is just abominable. So we don't want that money. There are other states that are making the same movement. The reality is the number of people who are unemployed 
and the drainage that they're making on state unemployment trust funds and the fact that other governors have done what Jindel has done, which is to keep unemployment taxes low enough that they don't build up a sufficient trust fund, is that the reality is that the federal government now owns most state unemployment insurance systems because they, they only exist from loans from the federal government. We cannot afford to have millions of Americans not getting unemployment insurance. This is not simply Louisiana that is affected when someone loses their job and loses their income. That's a family that's not going to buy a car. That's a problem in Michigan. That's a family that isn't going to buy food. That's a problem in Iowa. So this is not something just for Governor Jindel to decide that the people of Louisiana don't need unemployment. We talked during the campaign where President Obama reminded everybody, we don't live in blue states, we don't live in red states, we live in the United States. But if you're unemployed, you don't live in the United States. You live in a blue state or a red state. So it's very important at this point with the federal government paying for unemployment insurance in every state that we have a United States unemployment insurance system. It cannot be that some states get to opt out of their citizens having access to unemployment insurance. And why would that be a subject for us? Because look at the map, they, will are, they really are the red states. It's, were you once in the Confederacy, or did we acquire you through the Mexican-American War? If you're one of those states, and where do we live? At least among Native Americans, Hispanics, and African Americans, we live in the Confederacy or one of the states that we got through the Mexican-American War. So disproportionately, our populations are in the states with Governor Jindal's. So why should our governors get to deny us American unemployment insurance benefits? But why not fix that? Why not fix that? And again, because right now the federal government is bailing them out. They don't have any more money in their trust funds. They must, be bar they must borrow the money from the federal government. They don't have their own money to support them through this crisis. So right now, uh, as a matter of process, that's, that's where we are. So, um, so I, I would leave with you just thinking about those two sort of important elements of social insurance. We created social insurance because the market can fail. The market does not always get it right. And we're experiencing a systemic market failure. It isn't just greed. It isn't just corruption. The market priced homes incorrectly. People were not just duped. The market got it wrong. These were not sustainable home prices. And because the market failed, we need this social insurance to insure all of us. And what we need is a system that then is fair to all of us. And so we need to think about not just assets from the individual perspective, but the assets that we as citizens have made claim to by creating laws to protect us in these systemic times of systemic failure. Those are also our assets. Um, I just want to start by asking people, does anyone remember what the name of the session is? You've been here for two days. <laughs> Anybody? So it's mo mobility and security, right? Two things, mobility and security for workers, right? So 
I think what I'm going to do in the short time I have is sort of just make a, a set of comments, short comments about each of those. So let me make sure we touch upon the, the whole picture of workforce development and uh, asset building. So um, at the Aspen Institute, we work on a whole wealth of strategies uh, for, to address poverty alleviation. A lot of that is workforce development. How do you get people into decent jobs, you know, well-paying jobs with benefits? Some it's about self-employment, which is a choice that some people make about how to make a living. And then there's all this stuff about financial services and asset building and all of that, right? And it's a complicated picture today for people, as we know, uh, from, from looking at the financial scene out there. So I, I just wanted to offer up a, um, a couple um, a couple of thoughts or groups of thoughts about how we might do better on all these things, even possibly without huge amounts of money. And uh, I, I once had a math teacher that said, you know, everything is obvious if you think about it long enough. You know, and, and when you think about a workforce system, when I first got to know it, I could not imagine a system that was more difficult to work with and more unnatural, you know, almost. So for instance, um, how do we recruit people for, you know, workforce programs? Do we know? We recruit them by the program, okay? Who wants to do this, who wants to... It's how, but how do you, as an individual, find a job? You think, oh, what am I good at? What do I like to do? I mean, and you start off in that path, right? So that's a very unnatural way, in a way, to get people into the workforce is we have these five programs. If you want to sign up for one of them, you know, do that. And something that we could think about doing is changing the way we actually recruit people, you know, into our workforce system. I think another thing that we know in the real world that most people, many people find their job through social networks. I mean, who do you know? I mean, how many times have you or you know someone who got a job because somebody knew somebody or they had an opening or whatever? And we also know that among a lot of low and moderate income people, they're poor not only in terms of money but in terms of their networks, right? So there are beginning to be some workforce programs that actually are teaching people networking skills. You know, trying to get them into those rich networks where the jobs actually can be located. Uh, I think another thing we know that um, none of us can do anything really well yes. when, when you're very when you're very very stressed. And I think well, this is something I'll talk about after. The... No, 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 please. Uh, well, let me just wrap up this piece of it. Um, if you if you're very very stressed, so I think poor people especially need the time and space to learn, which points to income supports, childcare even transportation cars to get to their place of work. And finally, they need to be able to work, uh, I mean, to, to learn all through their lives, right? Because this is no longer a static economy. So this, those are just some short thoughts about how we can make the workforce system better, even if we don't plow enormous amounts of money, additional money into it, which I, of which I hope we'll have some. Finally, um, uh, Linda spoke very, I think, poignantly about what unions used to do for the worker. And uh, Bill has spoken about what government can do for income security. I would just urge us not to forget about what employers can do. Yes, the defined benefit programs are gone. We'll never have, again, you know, employers that pay for your whole health care system and for your college, perhaps. But don't forget that in addition to wages and benefits, employers can still make a difference. They can still connect employees to financial institutions at their place of work. They can get people better banking services. Even if they don't provide you know, matching in their savings plans, they can default people into 401ks. They can provide life and health insurance options at a cheaper cost than you could buy it on your own. They can sponsor EITC sites. They can provide financial education at the workplace. And they can provide troubled employees with access to confidential financial counseling. So I guess my last plea to you today is let's not forget what's already there and in the system, even if it's not everything and not everything that we would like. Thank you. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the congressman from the second congressional district of Pennsylvania, uh, Congressman Ch Shaka Fatah. Is that I do that correctly? You got it. Uh, somebody always slaughters my name, so I, I, sorry if I have. Uh, the congressman has received widespread acclaim for his work in the Pen Pennsylvania State Legislature to implement a program that provided uh, government assistance to struggling homeowners to, in delinquent and mortgage, that were delinquent in mortgage payments and facing imminent foreclosure. 
This program was instrumental in helping over 300,000 homeowners in Pennsylvania keep their homes. As a result of the success, he has proposed the Homeowners Emergency Mortgage Assistance Act, HEMA, which would take this statewide program and implement it on a national level. As an education champion noted for his innovative efforts to advance opportunities for youth of color, Congressman Fatah has received accolades for his national gaining early awareness and readiness for undergraduate program Gear Up, which encourages economically disadvantaged minorities to pursue higher education degrees. The Congressman has also voted to increase funding to predominantly black and Hispanic serving institutions. He's also supported legislation to improve college retention rates for low-income black and Hispanic students and to lower Pell Grant interest rates. Uh, I hope that you feel very ho at home here with us. Congressman, welcome. Well, <clears throat> let me say, uh, first of all, I apologize for being late, but we uh, actually have votes at the same time that I was supposed to appear here. And um, it'd be probably difficult to explain why I would be missing those votes and being right across the street uh, from. Uh, so it, it, uh, it's impossible for, uh, I guess, us to, to take uh, all of the time that would have been uh, normally associated with this. And what I want to do is, rather than give a talk and then answer questions, I think what I'll do is not give a talk and answer questions. And that way you'll get a chance to ask whatever questions you might have. And um, if that's, we're in agreement? That works for me, okay. So please, don't be shy, and I have a hearing that started 15 minutes ago uh, on um, uh, uh, border security along the Mexican border. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna be leaving at, uh, in 15 minutes, so don't miss your opportunity to get your question in now. I'll try to be as concise as possible in answering any questions uh, that get asked. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sabrina Lamb. I'm the executive director and founder of worldofmoney.org, which is dedicated to the financial education of youth ages 12 to 18. How can our organization, the work that we do in empowering young people from moving from wealth uh, consciousness to real estate investment and so forth, work with the administration to make this a federal mandate so that they're able to grapple what's going one on of, economically? Yeah. One, of, one of the big challenges uh, is that we talk about illiteracy rates, but financial literacy is one of the critical uh, missing links in uh, communities, particularly where you have an aggregation of poverty. Uh, where, but even where uh, that aggregation is less, uh, less uh, potent, there's still a lack of financial literacy uh, in terms of a whole range of issues. Uh, and so it's very, very important, not just for your organization, but throughout. We need to look at uh, curriculum changes in our public schools. We have some 55 million young people in public schools, and we need to find ways to uh, invest early in financial literacy training, uh, so that they are aware of the importance of uh, a whole range of, uh, of issues that they will confront from savings to, you know, balancing a checkbook to making sure that they uh, account for uh, a, uh, a spending plan, a budget uh, outline. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done, and there are great organizations that are involved in their variety of ways that the administration, through the Department of Education and the Department of Treasury, are looking at how to, to go about that. So I think you should be in direct contact with the Department of Education and Treasury. And, uh, and through, um, through our work on financial services, we are looking at not just for young people, but for adults. There are many of us who, are, as adults, um, are not as attuned as we ought to be. Uh, and given the, uh, the crisis at the moment, I think a lot of people's attention are now focused on these questions about what's happening with 401ks, where they invested, what's happening with our pension funds, uh, you know, as we see these uh, significant challenges in the marketplace. So there's a, a lot of room, and I think the Internet, and I think uh, public television and public radio, and, uh, and there are a number of other mechanisms, including um, utilizing, um, you know, community institutions to be involved in that work. We've developed a product called the uh, Benefit Bank, uh, back in Philadelphia that I've been involved with to uh, help people be, uh, take access online uh, to resources that are available to them. And it's free, on-site, anywhere 
uh, in the country uh, that is willing to provide it for free uh, to their uh, to people who who interact in their uh, their community center or workplace or school. Next question. Um, hi, how are you? Uh, Elizabeth Warren at COP had suggested a, a financial product safety commission, and we're very much in support of that idea. But to expand its what it does to really look at potential discriminatory lending and how those products might affect our communities. Just wondering if that had any traction at all. It's got a lot of traction with me. It makes <laughs> a lot of sense. Um, and um, you know, we've had problems with the Consumer Product Safety Commission in terms of tracking lead in toys and you know I mean there are going to be challenges even if we create a, a regulatory entity but I think a regulatory entity is called for uh, because almost none of the products that are um, uh, that are out there now are regulated sufficiently in ways that consumers could feel any any protection even though as taxpayers you're on the hook uh, in a lot of instances as you now see when things go array uh, we will we will step in and bail, uh, bail out at the other end. So we need to regulate on the front end uh, to, because I think it not only provides protection for the individual consumer, but for the society as a whole. Congressman, thank you for coming and joining us and for answering our questions. Uh, I just have a, a concern with You missed the great speech I was going to give you. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I used to work for General Motors and the Central Founder Division, and they had uh, incentives for uh, the employees. The salaried employees got to purchase uh, stock, and the hourly employees were given an, an opportunity to, to save. And in both cases, General Motors would match the contribution. And I was wondering what, what happened to, to those incentives. Were there incentives? There must have been incentives because they usually, these employees don't usually do it for nothing. Well, I was the author of the uh, American uh, Profit Sharing Act. I, I wanted to incent corporations to be involved in profit sharing uh, through stock purchases and other mechanisms. Uh, I think that that and to give a, a uh, to give uh, appropriate incentives for them to do that. I think it is a, a wonderful way beyond. You're never going to get wealthy to a salary. Uh, I don't care how high the salary is. Wealth building is a, uh, it's really a separate enterprise. And, and so it's very important uh, that, uh, that we put some, some teeth in the notion that we're going to have an ownership society. So I think that we should be supporting corporations that are involved in profit sharing. We should provide incentives, and we can do that on either the procurement side or on the, uh, the tax side uh, of the equation. And I think it's something as a public policy we should be uh, more invested in. And I'm also interested in, uh, yeah, I'm involved in an activity in Philadelphia where we're trying to build a, a, uh, a trust fund, essentially to provide a guaranteed last dollar uh, for every uh, student who wants to go on to college. We've given away $25 million over the last four years to some 13,000 students. We raised a separate uh, $5 million for this trust fund, and we need to raise uh, another $95 million or so for it. But the, uh, the point is, is that I think that, uh, that, that we need to provide a, uh, a and because, you know, a kid with a college degree uh, is going to earn, based on our census data, a, a million point three more over their lifetime than a kid with a high school diploma. Uh, so it's almost like hitting the lottery in terms of, of uh, what it's actually worth. And we don't communicate well enough to young people, uh, even though there's a lot of other reasons to get an education uh, other than the fact that you're going to make a living. Uh, but it's not an insufficient, a, a, a insufficient reason, I think, to provide early incentives that get them to start to think about the fact that they will make a living uh, with an education. And that's also part of the wealth building uh, uh, enterprise. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Congressman, thank you so much for your time. A uh, two-part question uh, re related to education. Uh, Sunday's New York Times actually ran an article showing that the stimulus funds that went to education, right. uh, of course, uh, went into a formula uh, that advantages uh, high-income uh, or high-wealth districts as opposed to low-wealth districts. Uh, and so the question for uh, us is, you know, is anyone taking a look at how to recalibrate those formulas? And a part B of that is, what about 
the restructuring of education financing across the country in general? I mean, shouldn't we be thinking about new models uh, aside yes. from property taxes for financing education? Yeah, let me, uh, let me uh, say two things on this, uh, and I'm going to be a little bit long-winded. One is, is that uh, the New York Times was wrong on Sunday in its report, and I'm going to comment on that in a minute. But to take the more important part of your question about school finances, in 1972, uh, President Nixon had the School Finance Commission established, and in its final uh, report, it said that as long as we have a, a property tax-based funding system for schools in our country, poor children are going to disproportionately fail. Uh, that is not contradicted in any report, any findings of the Congress. In fact, it's an absolute truth, and it exists to this day. I have uh, asked the um, Obama administration to uh, create a commission that will focus now on working with states, even though it's four decades later, and um, to help them think through uh, funding formulas that would be different and will provide comparable resources uh, in each of our, uh, in, in each school district and for each child. It's an amazing set of dynamics. If you were designing a system that would hurt poor children, you could not have designed a system better than the one that we have now. Um, and uh, it is, uh, so, and we have been joined in that call now by every imaginable uh, civil rights uh, education advocacy group uh, across the country. And, and I think that, uh, uh, Based on what I know, we'll have some very encouraging news uh, down the road on that. So the talk, the really move in terms of changing the, the way schools are financed. And just to make the point, you know, I mean, what we're talking about is situations where every single day for 12 or 13 years of a child's education, they're getting less of everything we know they need in order to be educated. And, and that is in comparison to children in the wealthiest school districts in, in our suburbs in which the, 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 those children are being provided, in many instances, what is required. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we act surprised about the result. Uh, and this happens almost in every state, in every school district uh, throughout the country. So, but to get to the point about the New York Times, the stillness dollars were driven on a formula that uh, the, the kind of the, the, was buried in the story, where it said that the, after saying that some rich districts got some money, that it said that most of the money was provided to needier districts on the Title I formula. That is, that the first decision that was made by the Obama administration was that we were going to drive this money not through new programs or new formulas, but through existing formulas. There were four to choose from, and the, the one that was chosen, uh, a Title I uh, formula, was the one that drives money uh, most effectively uh, to large urban districts and poor rural districts uh, in which the majority of the kids need help. There, is, there are in maybe two states an anomaly in the formula in which a few wealthier districts get a few more dollars, but uh, it's about uh, no more than about $200 per kid more than they would have gotten. Uh, but the formula, as a general matter, for about 98% of, uh, of everybody else in the country works very well to drive money to poor children. And at the New York Times, if uh, it was written by a guy by the name of, of Dylan, if you'd have spent a little more time or actually talked to someone involved in the process, uh, which, you know, at this day and age in journalism, we can't always depend on, um, they may, but they were just looking to try to take a quick hit on the stimulus program. What is true about the stimulus program is that the targeting on it across the board has been the most uh, sophisticated effort ever to drive money to poor communities uh, around the country. That is that if you get down into the, the, the small print of it, uh, you will find in detail after detail. So there's a, there's a, there's a uh, in one of the small prints it says that if, if you have a counties where there's been an aggregation of poverty uh, over 25% for more than three decades, then over 10% of the money allocated to that state has to be spent in that county. That specifically drives money uh, to poor communities that have been overlooked uh, for a long period of time. The, uh, and you can go through program after program. There was a lot of effort put into, um, within the concept of driving money through existing programs, uh, focusing that money in the right way. So we are, um, we're very pleased about it, and we will see as the stimulus dollars roll out more and more, I think, evidence of uh, the work, uh, particularly that the uh, Congressional Black Caucus uh, and uh, Congressman Rangel on the tax side and uh, Congressman Clyburn and 
on uh, on the House side, uh, Congressman Cummings on transportation issues, where there's not only a, a specific requirements for women and minority-owned businesses, but a bonding assistance so that they can get the working capital that's needed. So I, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm very much pro-stimulus, and um, you know I know the New York Times is going to do a better job the next time they write about it. Let me just, I'm going to uh, take one last question, and then I have to go to my hearing. I'm already a half an hour late. Yes. Um, quickly, there are people who were foreclosed before the incentive package. Yes. Is anything being done to help them? In some cases, you have communities where people who were foreclosed because they couldn't pay these high subprime mortgages may have destroyed properties out of anger. Is there anything done to maybe help these people get back those houses that have not been sold to get them back into these houses and maybe funds to fix them up? No. Okay. But let me comment further. Um, since uh, 2003, I've been a, the, the, a, a fairly lonely voice on the Hill pushing on this mortgage foreclosure issue. Uh, in 03, we hit a 50-year high. I mean, it's not something that happened overnight. This has been building over time. Uh, and the, um, the, the reality is that as taxpayers, you need to know it actually costs you money for foreclosure to take place. That is that when you have a federal guarantee on the insurance, uh, the bank has no incentive not to foreclose. Once you, somebody's behind on a payment, they actually get their money if they foreclose because it's 100 percent guaranteed by the government and that the only thing that can happen if they don't foreclose is they may or may not get a payment from the person and that there's a, a whole subset of uh, characters involved in mortgages. The servicers um, have to pay the investors whether you make your payment or not. So they have an incentive to foreclose if you're late on the payment. So the, the whole system is designed against uh, mitigation or, uh, or negotiations uh, because the, the, the moneyed interest in the deal have an interest on either you paying your, your mortgage or foreclosing, and anything other than that really works against their interest. It costs the taxpayers, once a foreclosure happens, uh, usually eighty to $90,000 per house, and it's usually less than fifteen, twenty thousand dollars in question in terms of the actual mortgage payments that are behind. It would make more sense to help people stay in their homes um, and then it does to foreclose in it in terms of anybody's interest in the matter. Uh, but nonetheless, once foreclosures happen, um, you know, you have a you have a person whose credit is damaged, they are homeless or out on the street or uh, in a different um, in a rental situation and uh, the home that's foreclosed upon drives down the property values in a given neighbor. Once you have a foreclosure, it may not be in your house, but if it's on your block in your neighborhood, it's going to drop your property values down uh, on your uh, main investment. So it, nobody really wins. But for the, we have about 10,000 mortgage foreclosures a day uh, over the course of 08. Uh, that has started to slow. And uh, these intervention programs that have been set up through the uh, Obama administration are making a difference. They are first helping people who are uh, not behind on their mortgage, but whose, um, whose uh, adjustable rate mortgages are getting ready to uh, switch in uh, to a higher gear and to be able to work to modify those loans and to do some other work, and then to help people who are uh, behind but who are not in the uh, kind of foreclosure tunnel. So there is help. It will help about, you know, six or seven million families stay in their homes. It's not going to help everybody. There will be people who don't pay their mortgage and will lose their home. Uh, and in some cases, given the economics of the country, they will not be paying their mortgage by no fault of their own. That is that they lost their job and they can't find another job and they can't pay the mortgage. Um, and that's where some of the, the unemployment extensions and some of the other uh, programs in the stimulus package will drive dollars to those families that may help them uh, over a tough time. Let me thank you for your interest in these matters, and, and um, I have to run. Thank you, Congressman. Keep up the good fight. Um, I think our discussion is over.
<laughs> it's 2.30, and we were not insulted by all the uh, folks that had to leave and, on the 2 o'clock bus, and we know there's a whole bunch of others that are going to be leaving pretty soon as well. So uh, I'll hand it back over to you.